All right, all right, all right. So we are back. And after having some technical <laughs> difficulties, because being this great, this brilliant, this black, and ain't pressing a pretty ass nigga in the first place, um, we was bound to have some technical difficulties. Too Listen. much bandwidth. Too much Listen, drip. Too much drip. It's, it's drip and white supremacy. So we good, though. We good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so thank you. I want to get started because um, my nigga tree ass, like, I literally... <laughs> had to eat this lobster. My homegirl was like, bitch, you deserve it. You've been driving for 48 hours straight. And I was like, I do deserve it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so let's get into something I feel like you've been doing all day today. Yeah. Uh-oh. Why, why, why are you talking so much shit about Nancy Pelosi? What that white lady did to you? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you would start with that question. What happened? I was just trying to figure it out because I don't know. I don't know. She seemed like a very nice, educated, shrewd white woman. <laughs> so an older white woman, basically. <laughs> so my listen, I have so many jokes and so many statements I can make, honestly, but I'm gonna get real serious for a second at least. So you know, many of the, the Democrats um, and, or folks in the progressive community would say that what happened was like a transformative justice model and something that was really revolutionary and radicalizing. Right. And it just it's not wasn't. The truth. Right. It's it just, not the it, truth. Just, it just, it just, it just is not. And I think we have to be very clear, right? There, there are certain provisions within this Justice and Policing Act, which is what we're talking about, even, even before you get to the Kente Clause, which I was already kind of done because I knew members of the CDBC is the ones who greenlit that. So okay. it's like, y'all gave permission to these white policymakers to wear kente cloths when they were going to talk about Black people and policing. I'm already kind of dope over it. <laughs> but as a policy person, I had to set the pettiness aside and the terrible optics aside to read the bill. And when I read the bill, I was Oh, you read the bill? Uh, yeah, I Nigga, did. <laughs> you got to talk to us. You got to translate for us because and, we didn't read the bill. We just read the photo. Yeah, so there are, <laughs> you read the photo, which was enough to not read the bill. I was like, this bill is and, what? Okay, no, but go like, ahead and tell us about it. He's like, if you're wearing Kente cloths, I'm sure you're probably not to protect Black people, but mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, so besides besides being performative, um, the, the, there, there, there are some good parts in the bill, right? I mean, the, the bill is- Tell like, me what they are. Yeah, so, I mean, there are things that you should not have to make legal, to be honest, right? Like, you should not have to, like, make chokeholds unlawful nationally. Like, we should know that chokeholds are actually something that could kill people. And weren't they outlawed right? in New York anyways? And out, But, yes, they were outlawed. What does outlawed well, mean to a lawyer? Well, before Eric Garner was killed. Yes, they were right. <laughs> already right. outlawed, okay. right? So, it's just and so like, like, what happens when policy gets outlined that was already outlined? Like, what happens? So, does somebody so, get in trouble? So th that's the that's the plan, right? Whatever trouble means, right? That's the plan. But the mm -hmm. bigger issue ultimately boils down to the fact that people think whatever is in the law is already things that are morally acceptable or not, right? So there are many laws that we have on the books that are actually not good laws, right? We just accept them as good because they're law. But that's there are so many valid. laws across the country that we have that we know are actually not good laws. With the Justice and Policing Act, I mean, again, some of the good components, I mean, you know, if, if we want to believe that, you know, we know Chuck Holds are bad, right? I mean, it shouldn't have to right. be codified in law but they are at, as of this moment, that's the proposal. Um, the, you know, the parts that I, but I want to get to the parts that I dislike, right? I don't want to spend a lot of time on what I, what I also- So you don't want to tell us like, about what you like. Cause you was like, everything that protects black people is what I like. Let me tell yeah, you what I well, did like. <laughs> because what I did, cause, what, cause you know what DD, what I, what I did not like ultimately though, was a part in there. There's a section specifically on law enforcement grants. And so what law enforcement okay. grants ultimately mean is that there will be funding to go to local police. So the thing is what we're trying to push is actually the opposite so it's like why would we actually fund the police while simultaneously telling them that you shouldn't do chokeholds we know that what they're doing is already something that's counter to the law while funding them on implicit bias trainings and programs right. i'm sure all your viewers know that you can't like skills build your way out of being racist can't. they can't enter into a team building exercise to talk about white supremacy like those are things that are actually like more like internal things that you have. Like just because you learn about implicit bias doesn't mean you're going to be less racist. It just right. means you're going to understand why you're racist, right? So I feel like many... you just explained my entire class, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there, are just, <laughs> there are just many <laughs> reasons why I disagree with this act. Though there are some moments as a policy person, right? While I understand their incremental steps. So I don't want to pretend that I don't understand that incremental steps need to happen. 
And I believe that there's a such thing as insider outsider strategy. You need people on the inside who are going to push for some progressive change. And you need people on the outside like me who are going to continually push members of Congress and their staffers to do better. But will this bill protect some people? Absolutely. Is it going to get us to what we need for liberation and freedom? Absolutely not. Okay. And Thank I need to so take a sip because no, please ooh. do because as soon as my friend finished eating her lobster, this <laughs> lobster, yo, shout out to the black women in Boston who just came to visit me just because like they was like let's selectively social distance together, bitch. Um, and I really appreciate that. And also shout out to Ada who sat in front of me because she, while I was gone on that drive, she literally got my house entirely together and took away the crime scene that my three year old created. So thank uh, you, thank you, Ada. I appreciate it. Um, so something I wanted to ask you, well, first of all, I want to give this opportunity because you and I have a lot to cover yeah. to offer to the people joining us, not the people who are joining us just brand new, you got to wait in line, but to my following who has a question for Preston, I will selectively read through the comments and decide which comment I want to ask. Um, so something I wanted to ask you was, um, when, you know, when you talked about this bill in the first place and you talked about what you liked and, you know, briefly, and then you were talking about what you didn't like, what do you see as the biggest barrier to defunding the police? And what the fuck does so, defunding the police right. mean? Why are people having such a <laughs> problem with defunding the police? So defunding the police. So one first shout out to the black women and abolitionists who have been doing this work for years. Yes. Uh, yes. Like it, it's not a concept that just started yesterday within DC. People are like, oh my. That's yeah. novel. People are like, oh, this is a very unique. And I'm like, it's not that unique, actually. <laughs> At least it shouldn't be. Um, right. So, I mean, in D.C., honestly, I'll say I'm, I live in D.C. In D.C. specifically, we've been pushing for defunding the Metropolitan Police sure. Department since before 2014. Right. Um, okay. But, but it, it, let me just first say that many people know what defunding is, right? Like defunding equals defunding. We knew what defunding meant when we were pissed at members of Congress for trying to defund Planned Parenthood. We knew right. what defunding meant when we defund education all the time and medical services and Medicaid and Medicare. Like we know what defunding means. For some reason, people get really confused when we're talking about defunding the police because for them, they've only envisioned a world where we have police as safety measures. So in short, defunding Nobody the bats an eye when they defund educators. I mean- Exactly. Right, we're okay with paying teachers $30,000 and okay I mean, with like- I mean, talk about it. Right, and okay with defunding public schools in poor cities across the country and using that money to then fund private schools and parochial schools, right? But right. suddenly when it comes to police, we don't know what that means. So in short, defunding the police means defunding the police. <laughs> yeah, people describe it as like a reallocation or redistribution of social services and programs, which it, in short, that is what it is. But we need to be very clear that when we say defunding, we mean defunding. The goal is to get the police budget down to zero in every place that there is a police local, state, federal. Yes, you do use those services to then invest in things that actually are life-saving components for people's lives, right? So you and me, if we need housing, if we need healthcare, including mental health services, if we need employment, among other things, that is the purpose. But let's be clear, the purpose of defunding the police, because we know the history of police have always been around slave patrol to take freed slaves, pre-Black codes, back to their masters, quote unquote, right? The purpose has always been to capture Black people. So if the purpose, if the initial purpose, if the etymology, if we're going to use big words, right, <laughs> behind it is Get actually- love etymology, okay? <laughs> is capturing Black people, mm -hmm. then we know that in a current day, it can't protect us. The right. only reason why people are so afraid and what makes the biggest barrier to defunding the police are people's lack of imagination. People cre people pretend they care about young people and the children, oh, but no, they, they don't. don't. They don't. Because if they did, they would realize that the majority of young people, especially young people of color, young queer and trans people, they want a world that they are protecting themselves and less about police. They don't want school, they don't want police officers or as people try to nicely call them school resource officers. They don't want them in the classroom. What young people really want beyond, beyond besides their education and besides being actually treated like someone worthy of something, they want to feel safe and secure in a community that allows them to do so. And that is not possible with the presence of police when we see the history of violence, when we see people being killed every day, right? If we talk about Black Lives Matter, if Black Lives actually matter, we will be focused on defunding the police and not reform. You can't reform racist systems. You can't reform Are you an attorney talking about you can't reform <laughs> shit? Okay. Yes. 
Yeah, and, and, and let's talk about being an attorney for a second because I completely hear you and I agree. I didn't say shit. Well, I am saying yes. it. <laughs> I'm saying it. The, the problem, because there are so many issues with legal institutions. And I went to a historically black one and learned less, frankly. And I love, my classmates know I love them dearly. And I love my alma mater, North Carolina Central University School of Law. But what we did not train us on was thinking critically. We learned how to read a book. We learn how to digest information. We learn how to memorize. Many of us, I won't say all, many of us did not learn how to think beyond the black letter law. Many of us were not pushed to think beyond the black letter law. We were taught right. to pass the bar exam. And once we did it, then what, right? How are you actually impacting the quote unquote least of these? How are we impacting the most marginalized communities if all we can do is refer to the law and say, uh, it's the law. Right. right. Like right. when you actually just rubber stamp the law, you're not you're not being radical. You're not changing people's lives. Mm. You're trying to reduce harm in their lives, which there's a time and a place for that. I'm worried about the place where we can get all free. Right. And the law itself won't do that. Mass mobilization and organizing will do that. Policy change will do that. Some law can do that. But just focusing on the law will never do that. So we're going to bounce around between law and then those two tenants that you just mentioned, which was mass mobilization i forget the other one but i'll come back to it policy um, change so <laughs> policy change okay so um i want to know because i feel like you didn't answer your own question because <laughs> who am i i'm not asking questions anymore right <laughs> um what is your stance on black lawyers do you know mm -hmm. any good lawyer jokes uh why did a why did a lawyer why did a black lawyer go to law school why the joke ends there no, I'm kidding. But, uh, no, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. I feel uncomfortable. No. no. <laughs> listen, listen, I'm all about, I love my lawyers dearly. So this is all in jest. And I've been involved in bar associations across the country. Um, like, ultimately, but, do you think that, like, Black lawyers are, like, um, hurting the movement? And I'm saying it, like, be, no. be, no, 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 let me finish. Like, be clear. Yeah. Like, is it, like, helpfully radical or is it hurtfully respectable? And where can, like, the line mm. be struck, right? That's a good question, Dee Dee. Nigga, this is what I don't Listen. get paid for. You understand what I'm saying to you? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, honestly. So there are some brilliant Black attorneys. Right. Many, the vast majority are, are I, I think, the vast majority of Black attorneys are like brilliant and are actually attempting to radically, to change, I won't say radically, to change the environment. Um, you know, as I was saying before, there's like an insider-outsider strategy. Everyone can't be as quote unquote radical as me. It just won't be helpful on the inside, right? There are some people right. who need to be less vocal and figure out how to actually make our, our ideas salient for their folks. Right. Um, I knew when I was in law school and especially after I start, uh, especially after I graduated law school that, that, was, that I knew my role was outsider. Like I just knew it because right. there was something that was so like audacious and amazing about being able to be vocal and bold and loud and annoying and frustrating right. and getting your point across, right? Um, at the same time, right, we also have lawyers like Law for Black Lives who work a lot with the larger movement for Black Lives. Right. We also have some like really good young Black lawyers who are attempting, like who are actually providing pro bono services um, for like protesters Shout out who to are Abby arrested. in Brooklyn. Okay. Yeah. Like Listen, <laughs> there are so many brilliant Black attorneys, especially young Black attorneys. So this is not to slight any, I mean, I'm one of them. I mean, there's not, it's right. not to slight Black lawyers. Come on, self accolade. No, you're an excellent Hello, attorney. thank you. Let me back. You're welcome. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it, is, it is, however, to challenge us. Um, we have a lot of work to do. We, we really have to start investing in the community. And mm -hmm. so often, many black lawyers, and I've said, I've shared this publicly, frankly, so this is not a surprise to anyone. Many black lawyers, again, learn how to be a lawyer by reading books, but not really by investing in community and community okay. care. Um, and, and I'm very, and I, and I, and I, I'm very serious about this because like, I deeply believe that like lawyers have to listen to what's happening on the ground just like policy people have to listen to what's happening on the ground so often there's this like grass tops approach there's this like top leading the bottom no gay pun intended uh but if you're gay and i look good call me. i mean um, but, but, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but but there has to be a bottom up approach and that quote unquote mm. bottom has to look like grassroots and folks who are most impacted leading and i will bring in a congresswoman in this space 
Um, Ayanna Presley, uh, you know, Congresswoman in Massachusetts, who like, you know, she's not the only person who obviously has this sentiment, but one of the things that she said that's very clear is like the people who are closest to the pain have to be closest to the power. And that is something I deeply believe in when it comes to policy change. I train young people on being comfortable talking to members of Congress and their state lawmakers. Many of them have so many brilliant ideas and so many great ideas, but they're afraid because they've been shoved through, they've been shoved out the system, right? There's mm -hmm. so many adults who are adultists to them right, or, okay. um, right? Right, so they don't accept their opinions as something that's true, but they are the experts of their own experience. All of that to say, Black lawyers are needed in the movement. We just have to be of much course. better about actually like- Okay, being, yes and, okay. Listen, like being legal trainers, being observers and actually listening okay. to the folks who are like most deeply connected to what's actually happening to their own lives. What's the difference between a lawyer and a catfish? <laughs> what? Mm, one's a sun scum scucking bottom dweller and the other is a fish. I mean, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, what are your thoughts on mass protests being used to justify overtime and inflated police budgets? Uh, next. <laughs> no. <laughs> I hate it here. <laughs> no. <laughs> I have a lot of feelings on that, and that is the best way to summarize my feelings. <laughs> okay, no. What is it when they say in Congress, reclaiming my time? Thank reclaiming you. Reclaiming my time. <laughs> <laughs> You're driving down a dark highway. There's a fork in the road. Standing to the left is George Zimmerman, and to the right, Donald Trump. You can only hit one with your Nissan Maxima because you are a Black attorney. So who do you hit? <laughs> You know Welcome what? to the full set, nigga. Listen, <laughs> listen. I'm, I'm, now I'm probably supposed to be thinking about the bigger picture of the country, <laughs> but I'm taking Zimmerman <laughs> out. Like, like small wins, small listen. wins. <laughs> and, and the good, and the good thing is, my lawyer brain is thinking about can I answer this question? But yes, I can because it's contingency. Because you said if, and that yeah. means that <laughs> that means it's not a threat. Cause Cause you know, it. white people are gonna come all up in your mentions. God damn it. Trust <laughs> me, believed in you. <laughs> listen, I, I need black people to believe in me. Everybody else is whatever. Mm. <laughs> but, come listen. on. You, you once tweeted that people who, um, you tweeted that people who saw you as radical are now coming to understand you. And I feel like I'm seeing mm. all the Bath and Body Works <laughs> and Fashion Nova notifications that they give a fuck about black lives, but they still have listen. to give me my 50% off, but it's fine. <laughs> And so <laughs> I just need to know, like, where do you think, what do you think made the difference? Like, is, yeah. is it lip service right now, which is fine if it is, something like happened inside of here. Mm -hmm. um, when Mark Jacobs said, you know, I've got insurance, like mm -hmm. it's just things and like people can't get their lives back. And I was like, nigga, Ooh. there's a pair of glasses that's been sitting in your Ooh. window for two weeks. And <laughs> I like, need the real. Know, how bad, how bad do you feel? So this is what I tweeted to Uber. Uber sent out this message like Black Lives Matter. I said, but how many of my rides are free? <laughs> right. That's what I wanted if, to know. Like if my well, life Is matter, there a second wave of, of, of looting that's going to happen? Because I missed the first. You, <laughs> And shout out to Kimberly Jones. What's her name? Kimberly Jones, who came out with this like this viral video that's been talking like breaking down. Yes, I shared it like yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that we need protesters, organizers, and looters, or rioters, protesters, and looters. One hundred percent agree. But you know um, they don't want to hear that <laughs> at all. Um, I think your question. All your questions are good. Listen. <laughs> they really are. I want to say this is gang, probably one of the best. Gang, gang. This is one of the best interviews that I've been on. Yes, <laughs> so I love to like, see oh, it. people are like, oh, you're a lawyer, but people who know me off offline know how I get down. So I'm okay. <laughs> I'm thankful for for this. So what I'll say is, I think um, there. I think it's both and again. I'm, I'm mostly a both and person. Um, but I do think there are some companies that are actually now attempting to really invest in like diversity, equity, and inclusion, and understanding what's happening, understanding who their consumers are, really trying to like get at like how do we actually operationalize what Black Lives Matter means. Right. There are definitely, I would argue, sadly, the vast majority though of companies are just saying Black Lives Matter while not promoting Black people at work or using it to tweet, right? Because the truth is, these people can have like, say all the things they wanna say, but it's like when your company itself is 90% white and you're not promoting black folks, I don't wanna hear about you saying black lives matter. 
because you're proven based on your own internal hiring practices and who you promote or demote that you don't care about black lives or at least your black staff. You will fly so, on the wall at my daytime job, right? That white <laughs> people swear I don't have, right? Listen, it's like, I, <laughs> right. People, people, but people have been saying that. I mean, it's like, oh, Black Lives Matter. It's like, do they? Because I'm pretty sure you were at Amy Cooper last week. Clearly, clearly, so. I, it, there's no way. There's no way, like, Black Lives Matter at my job. And, and I really don't care if I get fired. It, it probably <laughs> be for the best. But, um, the, you know, they're having, like, these tough conversations. And I'm mm -hmm. the person having to labor through them. Right? Of course, I'm, I'm, of I'm course, moderating the conversations. Black. I'm moderating the conversation, but not just because I'm black, but because I'm the most radical and outspoken person. Uh, but it's not they're gonna use that, that labor. They're using my labor and I get paid still the same $16.50 an mm. hour. <laughs> and I'm like, do you know who the fuck I am outside this job? Y'all better be glad that I need this bi-weekly insult every two weeks. Like mm -hmm. it's Munchausen syndrome. Right. I know I I know I can do without it if I put my yeah. mind to it. But I was like, you know, but it's interesting because I really feel like there's nobody that looks like me with the exception mm -hmm. of one black woman. And they all mm -hmm. treat her like she's the black woman. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I work in a C-level executive suite. So it's yeah. very interesting to me. It's very yeah. interesting. It's a lot of lip service going on out here in these nonprofit streets. So Listen, well, let me know if something happened because I know many attorneys. So listen, you heard Thank that you. here. Yes. Thank yes. you. Because CC, if they did, it will be illegal. CC, so yeah. You see my company. Thank you. So listen. Um, <laughs> Listen, I got all the things. So something else I wanted to ask you, you have brought it up actually when you was talking about um, like the history of policing. Something I think that not enough people, and I think that you do this greatly, and so that's why I want to have this conversation with you. Uh, I think not enough people bring up is the history of policing in sex work, that it started mm -hmm. around the same time um, as the time that cops, I feel like Boston was one of the first police departments, mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. talk about criminalizing sex work and like saying that prostitutes aren't allowed to be uh, working class, right? Um, yeah. My question to you is, how is the decriminalization of sex work a public health issue? How yeah. is this frame a policy? Are there any negatives in framing it through decrim work? Because I remember you were having mm -hmm. that kind of conversation with April from BLMDC and yeah. Monica when she was like, I have some real questions about how yeah. to address this. Yeah. Is it decrim or is it defund? I mean, yeah. like, what's so the listen, difference? Listen, all of these are ways to get to abolition though, right? So one of the things I really appreciate about the, the aid to abolition.com, please, 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 so your viewers check it out. Um, it, it is Someone a way, do me a favor and yeah. post that link, please. Yeah, eight, eight, the number eight to abolition.com. Okay. One of the things that's really important for people to recognize that, right? Like defund means defund. No matter how many times people try to wordsmith it, like it literally means cutting the police budget to $0. We can make it as salient or palatable as we want to around reallocation, redistribution. It means cutting the police budget to zero dollars, right. right? So, period. So, when it, but also one of the things that is listed beyond defunding the police um, is, is, is around like decriminalization of survival, right? And that part of that is sex work. So, really, sex work is just the exchange of services. Um, you know, for, for trade, right? Trade for sex. And so there are many people who engage and there are many reasons that expand like choice, circumstance and, and sometimes coercion, right? Um, right? And there are some complicated factors beyond that. Um, but we know we mean we're talking about sex work. Sex work is work. Sex work is real work and people need to be, you know, funded as such. And so, you know, one of the things that we know when it comes to sex workers is that police officers commit some of the highest rates of sexual assault against sex workers. Yes. Um, yes. So when people talk about this idea of like, you know, there are other like, you know, sex workers can go to police and it's like, they can't go to police in its current form actually, because they're criminalized. And then they also recognize that the police won't be, you know, quote unquote criminalized for their behaviors of rape, right. of sexual assault. Because how many, how many sexual assaults are actually charged or like exactly. follow through on? So there's that. Exactly. And we know, and, and these are for people who believe in the cops, right? You know, there are many people who will go to the cops to report crimes of sexual harassment and assault or things that they know of that nature, and nothing happens. In fact, if you're a person of color, especially Black women, like, you are actually treated as a criminal or as the defendant when you're actually a survivor. And so it right. seems like these are, is it these, like, exacerbated harms to people, right? So you talk about health. If we want to just dig deep and even talk about global health, there was a report. Come on, global. <laughs> there was a report three years ago from the Lancet Commission, um, which is a commission that focused on a lot of health. One specifically is HIV, um, and it focused on HIV prevention, treatment, and care. Their studies over the course of several years found that 
if you decriminalize sex work, you avert HIV acquisition by up to 47%. So when we talk about like, you know, people being tested and treated and what sex work decriminalization can do for health, we could actually be having real conversations around like treating and preventing HIV. We could actually be having conversations around sex workers being able to carry condoms around without actually yes. being prosecuted, right? And in and, and places in this country, right? Um, so there are many positive approaches to sex work decriminalization. And at the end of the day, all you got to know is, right? Like people want to fuck for pay. And at the end of the day, that should be okay. Thank you for the affirmation. <laughs> yes. Yes, listen, always. And, I, and, and the thing is, people need to realize what sex work is, actually, because there are so many people who will, like, you know, masturbate morning, noon, and night to OnlyFans accounts and swear they're against sex work. It's like, actually, you're not, <laughs> right? If you go to a right. strip club, you are for sex work. Like, right? right? Like, it, there are so many, sex work encompasses so many things beyond this idea of what people have about sex work. And I blame Law and Order for that, frankly. <laughs> like, I literally blame TV for distorting people's ideas of what sex work is. Because sex work is right. normal. It's one of the oldest professions that we know, and it should not be criminalized. Right. And so, like, even the criminalization is, is like, giving birth to, like, new language, like, full-service mm -hmm. sex worker, right, instead of right. all of these things that we've been taught, like, ho, oh, slut, you know, exactly. or, like, you know, I, I think about conversations that are, are all around me, so I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, I learned that the Albany, I, I live in upstate New York, the Albany police budget is 50 million, whereas mm -hmm. the Albany youth services budget is 750 thousand um and so i think about new york at 189 million right and so mm. to me i feel like i feel like if, if people are saying like there's no money there's no money there's no money um and i think about all the the budget line items that these yeah. police departments are now incurring um there has to be um this 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 is not a fad um yeah. i think that people may think that that oh it's just you know we're painting yellow paint into the streets now um over here let's on talk Mark about Street. that though let's Go talk ahead. about that though do you know what do you know the amount of do you know the budget right now for dc the proposed budget for our metropolitan police department no tell half, me because some people were asking me today i was like I half know. a billion dollars billion DC. half a billion wow dc is 500 million dollars so there's actually proposals from the same mayor who, you know, got Black Lives Matter painted in the street, which shout out to BYP 100 and Black Lives Matter DC, who put defund the police right by it, right? Like, you I am so proud I had to go, I drove to DC just to go stand next listen, to it. I'm listen, in you, total support of them. Listen, yeah. you you do that, you put Black Lives Matter Plaza sign on, that's, that's all cute. That was cute. I saw his little projector. Right. That's a, that's a but, small ass projector listen. for DC. <laughs> But it's performative and it's optics, right? Like at the end of the day, there, like if you really want to like prove Black Lives Matter, fund like wards seven and eight, which are our poorest districts in the district, right? Which are mostly black and brown, which still has some public schools that are being defunded, right? Like provide incentives and services for them over there. Actually, like, you know, when we think about our water services, there is environmental, environmental racism right in our backyard in DC. Right? right, we know there are toxics that are happening, and we know that connects to reproductive health care. We know that in DC, for example, there's still like a, a wealth gap. Right, there, we know when you see gentrification, you'll see an increase in police violence, and DC mm -hmm. has rapid gentrification because of the mayor and because of the development. There's no surprise while we have people being killed by our own police force in DC, while we're at the same time meeting at the 1600 block, chanting people names in, you know, Louisville and chanting people's names in, you know, in Minneapolis. Like, chant our names here. Of course, chant everybody's names, right? Because Black folks shouldn't be dying by the hand of cops. But don't right. pretend that it's not happening here at the same block that you painted Black Lives Matter while trying to increase the police budget by an additional $19 million, right? Like, it is unacceptable. No, I definitely agree with you because while we were down there, I felt like, why Why are cops even here? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Listen, uh, Saturday I felt, I felt was a celebration. Okay. Saturday was a celebration. We're like, why are y'all here? Like, right. we are, we, this is like, it felt like a block party. Right. right. It <laughs> like, still looked like a black party. I told this white girl, ask Nene, ask Nene, Nene Tay. I told this white lady, I said, excuse me, excuse me. Hi, former Black Lives Matter organizer. Can you move your ice cooler and your bench off Listen, the end? And <laughs> I love her so much. Love, love her so I much. I mean, you gotta go. 
I said, yes. I'm trying to take a picture and you're just blocking the deep end. Okay. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, Listen. I wanted to ask you a question because you got a blue check. I don't have one. It's fine. I just want to keep talking about the segregation between state and church, right? So yes. in your article, Diary of a Blue Check Negro, you talk mm -hmm. about your life after being verified on Twitter. How mm -hmm. has your advocacy work been affected by your notoriety? Mm. You know, I'll be honest. Sometimes I don't even feel like I have notoriety. Like, I, I, guess, I guess it's because Me, it's just things. Same. <laughs> I guess it's because it's just things that happen, right? Like, it wasn't, I, I would be lying if I didn't say I wanted to obviously have a bigger voice because I did believe I can contribute to good conversation. Um, and I knew I wouldn't be negligent with my words. Um, whereas some people with blue checks are hella negligent and are hella bougie I'm about negligent it. negligent as fuck and I got a um, check, so don't get me one. Well, you not, we may define negligent differently. I mean, anti-blackness. Okay. Let me okay. be very, <laughs> I mean okay. like, homo antagonism, trans antagonism, anti-blackness, okay. you know. Okay. Um, but I will say, it, it, this is not to receive any kind of like, you know, sadness, but times are hard, honestly. I will say that it's been, it's been two different worlds, right? So when I got a blue check and when my followers started to increase over time, I immediately was like, okay, this is an opportunity to really use your voice to help folks, to provide resources, to donate money. You know, at one point for like a year, Right. once or twice a week I was just donating two lunches to people you know because that was the platform that I had and I was like I want to make right. sure this is a real thing for folks um I will also say white supremacists and and you know straight black men largely alike attacked me a lot and I you know and I usually wouldn't take that as a somber note until they like dox me until they mm -hmm. like targeted my mom and so it became very like it became serious right like I I like, I don't really want to, like, I I was like, a, it was like nigga moments. Like, I'm right. like, all right, I'm about to like lose my shit if someone tries to attack my family. Um, So those as are moments. Should, I, as you should, as you should. Don't want to tell you can't because you're course. a high profile exactly. celebrity. Like, exactly. I'm like, I can lose all this. I can lose no, all I'm this. Like, I, don't I don't give a fuck about it. Do Listen. one more swish, swish. I'm going to catch that hand. Like, you know I'm, what I'm saying? I'm thankful for a job that I love dearly thankful for mm -hmm. an organization that like really like loves my work and values me but it can go away in a heartbeat right. like if it came to me or that I'm gonna choose me and my family and my friends every time you know so all of that to say like it was it was I, I'm thankful for the following and my you know people will tell people will joke me all the time like you're my best friend in my head <laughs> you know all this other stuff and I'm so like appreciative I'm no, I'm so no. Oh, that's me. I'm no, sorry. Go ahead. No, okay. Oh, no. Well. <laughs> I'm so appreciative. I'm so appreciative, honestly. But I will say that sometimes they don't recognize also how much like threats we receive and how much like when you when you proudly speak up for black people right. and black gay people and black trans people and black women. Oh my God. It's like people look for reasons to attack you. And I'm just thankful that I have a network of like of affirming people who are just like, nah, we got you. We got you. I don't care what anybody, we got you. Do you, you know? believe so, in yeah. no new friends? I don't. I don't. I actually love meeting people. And one of the things that I, one of the, <laughs> that facial expression says how you feel about it. <laughs> I didn't say nothing. Go ahead. No. So, so I love I my my friends will tell you, uh, I love meeting new people. I love what's your friends. sign? I'm a Pisces. <laughs> I'm a double Pisces, actually. <laughs> so I'm gonna connect you and then cry. So <laughs> listen. Pisces too, but I got oh, that. Sure. I, I have like an Aquarius in my Venus. So Wait. I really want want like like when it comes to loving people, I'm like, I don't understand it. I don't want to know. What, what's your birthday? February 19th. Okay, I'm March 3rd. Oh, so, is different. Listen, we are a little different. No, so I'll say this. I love meeting new people. Well, some of the most like, you know, some of the best responses I've ever received people when I'm walking on the street, they're just like, this is awkward. Are you Preston? I don't even know how to respond to that yet, but they're always so uncomfortable doing it. And right. I'm just like, no, please. Like, right. what's your name? Right. Right. There's something about like, I can just remember people who I've like met in real life, who I've like mm -hmm. adored their work and right. how, how affirming they were. And so I always just want to provide that to folks, you know. Yeah, always. Um, I, I want to. I don't see my cash app going off though. Wait a minute, I think. Why well, they, they? They better because it's a whole fucking pinned comment. They some donation <laughs> you know, links. 
Look, there's I'm a Venmo. No. No. <laughs> Seth Chandler. Seth Chandler Pearson is watching. Niggas better be dropping shit into your cash app. All listen. the black gays is here. Come listen. on now. <laughs> Hi, Seth. I love you. Hey. Um, I What's going ask- on, Seth? Hey, got a shout out. Okay, that's my boo. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you, you had written in a law journal, like, I'm just trying to grab questions from the internet, really. So, uh, I mean, who else am I, right? What's the number one thing people aren't seeing as homophobia as a health hazard? Mm. Mm. I want you to know these, que- I want y'all viewers to know these questions are a shock, so I'm thinking too. <laughs> Uh, I'm really what, happy. I want you Oprah said, to invite me to her show. Listen, she needs to because this is this is a gag. I love every bit of it. <laughs> it's a gag. Um, it's a gag. <laughs> I don't think people really see homophobia at all ever really being a public health hazard. When people like, I mean, there's something that like homophobia or homo antagonism does to people, right? right? So like, we can of course talk about physical violence and what physical violence means on our bodies. Um, but we rarely talk about actually like what what like mental or emotional violence does to people's health. Right. The LGBTQ community has the highest rates of like cancer, um, and that's because of like the increased amount of us smoking. Right. Um, we have, um, and that's because of, like I mean, obviously pre existing conditions also impact LGBTQ people. We have some of the highest rates of like clinical and cultural competency, which obviously impacts our ability to even access the healthcare system. Um, you know, if you even really look at report recent reports from, I mean, this is transphobia and trans antagonism, but also intersected with homophobia. If you look at recent reports from the National Center for Trans Equality, like they show that, like, you know, even when you look at poverty rates, you know, there are high rates of poverty among the queer and trans community. That's something right. that also is a public health hazard. You know, there's this idea that like the LGBTQ social th- determinants of health. Exactly right. So like healthcare, employment, right? So healthcare, employment, like housing, like etc. Right. Those are all social right. determinants of health. In addition to like four other factors, there's usually seven stated factors of the social determinants of health. Um, but yeah, those are those are a couple, and so the. The, the truth is like, you know, there are so many barriers to accessing healthcare that, that obviously impacts LGBTQ plus communities, ability to, to, to receive good health, right? And that's, inter- that's especially important if you're an LGBTQ person who's intersected with multiple marginalized identities, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're like LGBTQ and living with disabilities, if you're LGBTQ and you're black or brown or another person of color, if you're LGBTQ and you are a woman, um, right? So there are, there are particular communities of people who are doubly and triply impacted, um, which contributes to public health hazards. Um, and I wrote about this several years ago. I mean, I think 2012, I wrote, or 2011, I wrote about it um, at, for a conference for the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization. Um, so yeah, so check it out. It's called Homophobia is a Public Health Hazard. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to check it out. Um, this is my second to last question because I told you I wasn't going to hold you. <laughs> um, so I, I want to ask about, I just want you to brace yourself. Yeah, ground yourself. I mean, do what you gotta do. <laughs> Listen, feet, feet planted on the ground. Feet planted on the ground. Come on, Erica Totten, you better show us, okay? <laughs> so, and I want to talk about your 2020 election predictions. Um, what are they? And what do you think, uh, what are your social predictions irrelevant of the election? Because I had asked earlier mm. if, um, like, what does Joe Biden need to do? we know he needs to just bring a black woman on board so that way mm-hmm. we can forgive him or yeah. temporarily forget yeah. um and I, I, was, I want to talk I, more about that okay all right all right so go yeah. ahead I'm, I'm gonna ask the question you gonna answer it <laughs> who am i so no no <laughs> excuse me so i have so many feelings about um Hold on, I'm sorry, I'm choking a little bit. The only way to no, serve it's okay. I need, is I need vodka. something to drink too but i don't want to be ignorant ada <laughs> can i have more alcohol please thank you <laughs> so Ice, thank you. I love you. Yes, sponsored by sponsored by right. (laughs) Um, So, okay. Thank you. So deep breath. So when it comes to the elections, okay. So let me just first be very plainly state around um, black women are often. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't have to tell you. 
Um, but some of your viewers are may. So if you were one of those, uh, black women are always treated as a mule of the world, right? Mm -hmm, so you know, it, it's it's it, and and as a and I'm a black man, right? Like I, I clearly don't know what it's like to be a black woman. But when I tell you, I would probably be fighting every day of my life. Woo! Like I I couldn't imagine. Like I get so angry <laughs> when I think about society's treatment of black women, and I get even angrier when I think of black men's treatment of black women. What did Damon and, Young say that straight black men are the white people of black people? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, and, and though I have some disagreement with that, because I don't think any of us are anything of white people, right? Poor, da poor <laughs> but, Damon. He's no. like, I hate oh, everybody. <laughs> but he's brilliant. So let me not, you know, I just have a disagreement with the concept, but white people mm -hmm. are definitely its own, its own group of people. Okay. I'll allow um, it. <laughs> but what I will say is black women are always treated as the mule of the world. And because of that, there's like this idea that like we just need a black woman's VP to save the day. And I'm just like, right. no. Black women are trying to save themselves. You need to save yourself. Like we cannot right, okay. keep waiting on black women to save the day. Like that, that especially mm. not for a society of people who ain't gonna do nothing but throw black women under the bus and, mm. and treat them with like heavily with sexism and racism among other things. So misogynoir. You know, exactly, exactly. So that's one thing. Another thing though about about Biden specifically when it comes to like. Well, let, no, this is actually really an appeal to the black community, or at least the the progressive, however we're defining that black community. Come on, let's talk about the black vote. <laughs> so we black people in large, we, many black people keep talking about the importance of voting, right? Which you know, I'm a I'm a voter all the time, um, and so. But the thing is, I have made it clear that I'm not about to shame non-voters, right? We need to actually have a conversation. Can you say that one more time? Because <laughs> I get judged a lot. I am no. a non-voter. No, I, 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 I'm not doing it. I'm Ever a since John Kerry yeah. and Obama didn't make the ticket, I've decided to use Listen. my time to organize my community. Listen, that, and, and I think we need to be clear that there are some people who've decided to be either or, and there's people who are both and. And some of some one of my favorite moments of being involved in BYP 100 was I, I won't leave I will leave the person's name out um, but they 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 are not a voter but they they were some of the best organizers I've ever seen in my entire life and they organized Black people to vote even when they were not going to and so it's like it's possible to still do the work of mass mobilization, even if you're not engaging in the ballot box. I just happen to be someone who wants to do both, right? right. I've been doing policy work for about eight years now, right? Like there are some benefits I do see from us voting, right? And in mass, Black people have never in mass engaged in the electoral process. And sometimes I do think like, what if we did, what would that look like, right? No, we don't know the answer to that to be very clear though. Of course. However, I do believe that we do not Sorry, and we need to actually talk about what establishment looks like, right? Like wh how, what status quo looks like, why are we not pushing for more radical change, right? There are so many, right? Because people are tired of the status quo. People are tired, like we started this race off the like most heavily diverse can like pool of candidates ever. It ended up with the two oldest white men who are running, right? Like there's something that's deeply unsettling so for people here. to actually push for like women or people of color or more radical folks. What I will say though, that disappoints me sometimes around our beloved community is that I see people demanding black people vote, right? But if you just demand black people to vote for Democrats, if you just demand black people to vote for any blue, no matter who, there's nothing that requires them to be accountable to us. They're just getting our votes. So people can be mad at Biden all they want to if he's elected. The truth of the matter is we've, give, we've given him and his camp no reason to be accountable to us. Because we're just saying, just take our vote because you're better than Trump. And because you're better than Trump, you don't have to do read. anything but be this better than read. Trump. <laughs> so it's like, if Black people actually want better and we want to be more like civically engaged and civically minded and actually care about policy change, we have to hold Democrats, Republicans, whomever's feet to the fire and say, you don't get our fucking, excuse me, <clears throat> You don't just get our votes just because you are better than a white supremacist who occupies the White House. You get Ooh. our votes by actually making an agenda that centers us and that actually cares about the issues that we have, right? So that is the thing that I need people to get. You don't just get the vote because you're a Democrat. 
you get the vote because you actually care about us. Because if not, there's no reason for us to hold them accountable. And there's no reason for them to give a damn about us. No reason. So I don't know no predictions. <laughs> I was about to say, nigga, what happened to the prediction? I, I, I mean, Thomas I do, Cleo. Like, so when I, so <laughs> I believe I believe both are possible right now. To be honest, really, I, I, I people were so shocked when when Trump won, and I was like, y'all really undercounted. I wasn't shocked. I went to sleep. Exactly. I already knew that nigga was gonna win. Exactly. I'm like, we're not paying attention to what really undergirds the country. <laughs> Right? People want to pretend that the country started off. It's like this country is founded on the American Revolution. Actually, it was founded on racism and classism, <laughs> right? Like that is what the country, we may call that American Revolution because we want to be salient to our young people who are reading books in elementary school, but we also call that slavery. And we also call that racism, right? So, like, what I, I, I never discount how racist this country has been for, for millennia. Um, so that doesn't surprise me, but I also think there's a lot of momentum happening right now from black folks, from brown folks, and from well-meaning white people. Quote How can we keep that momentum going? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I think we have to keep the momentum going. Honestly, I, mean, I keep saying this, but truly through, I, I would say, the intersection of organizing and mass mobilization and policy change. Uh, and people need to really keep paying attention to Movement for Black Lives, honestly, and this 8 to abolition.com. Um, I'm going to keep mentioning them, right? And I had nothing to do with abolition.com. There have just been things that I've been talking and training on, et cetera, for years now, right? right? right. But there's, been a, there's a brilliant group of Black women and Brown women who've come up with those approaches, right? And frankly, they've, <clears throat> they've been counter to the eight can wait approach that was really like, as I call them, like an independence day sale to police killings, <laughs> right? So it's like, if you stop chokeholds, you'll reduce black killings by 70%. And it's like, well, I'm looking for something that's going to reduce 100% of our killings. So right. when we get that approach, let me know. And, you know, through that, the eight can wait, you know, excuse me, the, the eight to the eight to abolition.com came out. I think we have to keep being in the streets. And the one thing that I keep saying is, and I'm going to keep saying it is, do you know just how angry people have to be to go outside and protest by the thousands during a pandemic to tell you that anti-Black police brutality? I was like, I thing. was getting in trouble for selectively social distancing. Y'all niggas just listen. Wild abandoned. <laughs> people were just listen. People were like, you know what? I'm done. I'm I'm angry at this moment. And right, and I'm like, but just think about the anger. Think about how righteously indignant you have to be. To right. be like, you know what? I know there is a global pandemic. Honestly, that is killing. Now, at this point, two million people around the world, but I'm that angry to go to talk about like what brutality looks like to me. To talk about like how police brutality is a gender issue, is a racial justice issue, is a class issue, is a reproductive justice issue, right? Like mm -hmm. those are the things that like I think can keep the momentum going, um, right? Like this is this is not a moment; it's a movement, and I really think people are going to be shocked. So when people ask the question who's going to win in 2020, right? Like, I, I don't mistake it that I believe that like Joe Biden is the most radical. He's not, right? Do I deeply personally believe through like my own opinion and policy and movement building work that he's better than Trump? Of course, right? Like, right. And, and I also believe that like- He's a draconian. It, Just I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, he's certainly better, but but he's also mm -hmm. not going to, to save us. And I think that is the thing we have to, you know, get in our heads that- no candidate, no policymaker will save us. We, as a community, are the people we need to survive. When I'm hungry, I ain't about to call, like, Biden. I'm going to call my friend. I'm going to call my homie. I'm going to call some movement building folks, right? Like, when I don't have a place to stay and I'm unhoused, I'm not going to call Ayanna Presley, despite my love for her, <laughs> right? I'm going to call my homie. I'm going to call my friend, my sister, right? So right. When, we, when it comes to material conditions, and the immediate needs, we know community is who we need. It's just when it gets at these massive levels, we forget and we think these are the people that's gonna save us. No federal policymaker or United States president has saved us and they never will. So what will keep us going, what will keep us activated, I think is by deeply realizing that we need both policy change, but what we really need is organizing efforts to lead that policy change. I'm so glad you said that because I wanna plug something. Um, I have gotten together with the National Lawyers Guild. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to mispronounce it because off the top of my head, this is my third cup of alcohol. <laughs> so <laughs> Avi and the movement for Black lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Um, organizing Black out of Baltimore, uh, the mm -hmm. Blackout Collective. 
um, Ruckus Society, we are basically trying to, uh, we're giving a free training. It's a 12-step program because so many wow. different people are involved. So it's it's bail, it's having mm. community agreements, it's roles, it's it's all the things that folks need to know who are newly politicized. What you eating? Um, olive. <laughs> okay. Listen, I got some shrimp that was calling my name. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it's folks that's newly politicized, but also I feel like a lot of the organizers I've been speaking to from Louisville, from DC, um, from across the country are feeling overwhelmed because they're on the front lines and having to direct people nowhere, really. Um, so we've gotten together and we've we worked with those five different organizations to launch a training program. It, it will be secure. So if you're trying to get through and you're not the right person, you won't. Yeah. Um, but it'll be free for Black organizers. If white people want to come and be on the strings of everything, like they do, that's fine. Uh -huh. But what we really need to, uh, is people to support because we will be giving grants of $500 to $1,000 for technology upgrades, VPNs, wow. um, all the things. So I've been busy. Um, but I just want to say thank you. It. That is both. That is policy and is organizing. And that's yeah. my wheelhouse is organizing. So yeah. I appreciate and, you saying that. And everybody has to know their lane, right? Like there is a Woo! role. Hallelujah! <laughs> listen, listen. <laughs> there's a role for all of us. Right. And I told so I was talking to a group of like 60 students the other day um, at Howard. And they said to me, well, online, they go to Howard. <laughs> and they said to me, like, <laughs> I, someone told me that I was a sellout for not going down to the protests. I'm like, during the whole pandemic, listen, even if it wasn't a pandemic, you wouldn't be a sellout for not going to a protest. Maybe you're not someone on the front lines, right? Maybe that's not your role. Your role can Thank be you for saying that too. It can be donating. It could be sharing resources. It could be engaging in radical self-care. It could be breathing, right? right? Like, do you know how violent it is, like mentally, physically, and emotionally to like see your people die on TV? This is to go down the street to protest them dying. Like I, I haven't watched the video. I refuse. To watch I never will. I, I am. I am. Thank you for strong. saying that because my best friend who's here, she's outside right now, but she's been trying to like give me the play by play. I'm like, nah, no, but shut the fuck up. I, I am a. I am a strong. Stop watching videos of black people dying. Like I, I am a, I, you will, I can tell you this for as long as I, I get it. If you need, let me be clear though. If listen. you need to, cause that's you oh. do that. But me personally, listen. I think I've seen it. I think I that's get a, it. That's an odd statement. Like I will never, I mean, and I actually would encourage people to not, right? Like there's some, right. no, that's valid too. But, too. but I'm just like, I want people to recognize there's actually like mental, physical, and emotional responses as black people that our body gets from seeing constant images of us dying. I mean, frankly, and you know, I know we ain't gonna say this, but that's my issue with Sean King. I ain't gotta go into this, but- Get like, the gallon of milk. <laughs> at the end of the day, he- <laughs> Sis, oh my God. <laughs> at the end of the day, he was he popularized himself by sharing GoFundMe's that no family member asked him to create and by consistently sharing viral My videos heart hurts. And back images, right? Like that I'm not I'm not about that life, right? If you want to actually contribute to like GoFundMe's, like do that, but make sure it's vetted. But the one thing that I always will talk about just consistently is that we do not need to see these images to to appeal to white people's humanity of us ever. Ever. So absolutely <laughs> but yeah no, but thank you thank you for affirming that for me because i was like yeah. i must be wrong if i don't want to see it this time like you know what i'm saying nope. like and I'm but i can't do it i can't do it i've heard so many accounts and i'm like and you know um a couple of people have told me be like i can't get it out of my head and i'm like yeah where i'm at right now with my own mental health i cannot i cannot take on that task no I you're right Listen, Didi, you're right and i need people to realize what they can and cannot take right and i know where i am <laughs> thank you for that um, what I will say is uh, my very last question. I feel like I could actually, I was very apprehensive about this conversation. I'm like, <sighs> I mean, I'd be reaching out to niggas and I'd be like, I'm expecting them to say no so I can talk shit about y'all being super high echelon individuals that don't never come back down to the hood or whatever. But I appreciate this whole conversation. You were real one. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. But um, I know that you have time constraints. I have a whole house full of people that was like, we came to see you, bitch. Why are you do a show every day? And I was like, I don't know. Um, Listen, it's fun. But, but this is community for you. And I, I love it. Yeah. I love it. So for me, I definitely feel like, um, you know, people cope with shit in different ways or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel very isolated. 
Yeah. <laughs> because my whole entire family, friends circle, um, I have a few friends here, obviously. I'm I'm pretty, um, whatever. So like that just happened. But like all my folks live in Boston. Like, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So it's like I feel sometimes isolated here because everyone has their own lives. And I can't just like pull up on Mo and be right. like, what's popping? Y'all, right. y'all make grits and the fish today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I appreciate like having these conversations and people, you know, in my friend circle, like we worried about you. Yeah. Um, why are you doing a show every night? I was like, cause the bitch had a schedule yeah. and then everybody I wrote to in April before the show was popping was like, yes, about uh-huh. that. I can come now. <laughs> so, uh-huh. yep. but it's good though for me, because it, this is actually one of the very first projects I've seen to fruition without anyone's help. Mm. Um, and so yeah. I appreciate the volunteers that have come through. But most mostly it's me being like, no, that's not what I meant mm-hmm. when I asked you to do that. And so yep. I'll do it. And so I just appreciate you sharing this space with me because it's important to me for yeah. like what I'm trying to envision here to actually be actualized. Like, you know, yeah. so thank you for that. I no, thank you. And thank you. So listen, I when I, you know, because we all heard of Didi Delgado, right? Like that's clear. But when I tell you people were like, when you had posted something, people kept calling oh, my name. Heard I said, of me? I Wait, said, tell me again. <laughs> We listen. Li- it, who, who? VH1, MTV, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> listen, Oprah. No. Well, okay. So you're gonna be a good. That's gonna give back to us all the time. Come on, Anyways, come on. So no, but like when people kept commenting my name or something, I was like, what are they commenting my name for? And I saw. I was like, okay, y'all. Yeah, keep commenting my name. <laughs> keep commenting my name. I want to talk to her. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, my last course. question this is like made my face smile like I feel like I'm in love like you know what yeah. I'm saying like but it's because I was already in love so but like it yeah. just I feel like my heart has smiled come on Pisces energy yes. <laughs> um so my last question is so sad but it's a two-pronged question because I'm a two-pronged bitch like I'm very <laughs> very multi-dimensional but I'm complicated and so yeah. <laughs> my question to you is is there anything I didn't ask you that one you were surprised I didn't ask you or two you were like Oh, we didn't even get to that. I got a book coming out. She didn't even ask me about my motherfucking <laughs> life. And then the second part is, the second part is, who would you like to see on the show? Honestly, so the first part of the question, no, that you you have, I deeply enjoyed this conversation. Thank I, you. I, I only wish it was longer, honestly. I know. Uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm secretly looking at like the live chat too, and I'm seeing friends and uh, folks pop in, and I just love it so much. Um, no, I, 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 yeah, I just wish it was longer. To be honest, I think when I think of shows like this, I do think of like current events, pop culture, you know, things that are happening in society, and I feel like you know it was, it was here and it was covered, and there were some surprising questions that were good, like some fun questions uh so that so that's good um no i don't have anything else there but who I wait before to you answer the other one yeah did you watch the sunday's episode of insecure i did don't tell me about it i just wanted to know oh. i want to keep I, <laughs> we haven't watched it yet because i was waiting for all these like it's like literally driving me back and forth like Listen. i'm just I'm, i want to take a nap okay like, but i can't wait to watch it i hope Please no one do. talks to me about it but you're Please saying do. yes it's a recommend oh 100 percent I mean, I'm still over Molly, but yes, <laughs> recommend, hard recommend. So I, okay, I'm over Molly too, but I will say someone who was a guest on the show and I have big, big love for her, she helped <laughs> politicize me and she still don't, she don't realize to this day. I met her in 2012, Emily Musso. Oh. I think she was like episode number 40, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 39. Um, she helped politicize me and she was like, first of all, y'all fuck around and give Issa way too much credit. She was like, cause, and she gave like a whole dissertation and I was like, I feel, you I know feel funny. Seen. So I don't <laughs> think, I don't think you have, I don't think being anti Molly is pro Issa. <laughs> I think they both got issues. Okay. I right. just think they both got issues. I just think this season Molly is showing the only thing that Molly's showing that's good for herself as of this moment are her outfits. And I just want her to want more that for herself. That green dress was clutch. I don't care what nobody. Oh, her says. outfits have been cute. Her outfits that look that, and that wig popping. Listen, <laughs> popping. I just need her looks to catch up with like her personality. This okay. Season. Right, <laughs> because, right, right. Or the opposite. So I need her personality say, no, no, to catch up no. with her looks. Her personality needs to catch up. It needs to be it's, her person. Is it ages Molly is to be never like grow wrong. up, Molly? Molly like, is, is never it, wrong. No, I'm saying, is it ages to be like, Molly, grow up. We need you to be emotionally mature right now. 
No, I think Amali is emotionally immature consistently. Okay, I just didn't yeah. know. I just I think I, she I feels think, very justified in her in her knowing, right? Because Molly, she's an attorney and listen. she's very successful, and she feels like, well, this bitch is a community organizer. She needs to get listen, her together. Like, I mean, one thing that we don't talk about enough about insecure is actually some of the classism that exists between Molly and Issa. Like, there's a huge like salary gap and discrepancy, and I think Molly holds it over Issa a lot. And I think what? Molly wants Issa to consistently fail. And so, like, that is, and she was upset when she recognized she didn't That can't be true. Listen. I'm going to tell you why it can't be true. Why? Because if you have a friend, uh -huh. they shouldn't, they should, they should be rooting for you. They shouldn't want to see you fail. So exactly. So we can, we can put a period there then. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Period. <laughs> it's, just, it's news to me it's not news uh -huh. to me it's not news to me i know a bunch of bitches like this so, <laughs> so but, but to yeah, your second question i do you, like show? you know i don't you know i actually don't even know if he's been on the show or not so i'm just gonna name him because he's my very best friend in the world and he just came out with a book and i just always want to promote him it's george johnson um you know no, george johnson okay. hasn't been on the show yeah. you better put in a good word for me i'm Listen, writing it down I, right now though. i 100 will look I, i'm I'll like even, Listen, wait, wait. He, he just came out with a he just came out with a really good, really critically acclaimed book. It actually just came out in the top twenty books to read this summer in both today in both Teen Vogue and CNN. Okay. Uh, but Black Queer Man from Plainfield, New Jersey, uh, my best friend in life, you know, wrote a book. Really, it's a it's a it's a manifesto on what it means to be Black and queer and growing up. And you know, after reading the book, one of the things that I deeply appreciated about this book is that it doesn't end on a somber note. Right, we've seen so many books around mm. like queer lives and bodies that end right. sad, right? Right. But it, but it doesn't. It end on like a very like you know what this happens to be my life, but I have a loving system around me, and this is how I actually manage that. And yeah, and I you know as a black queer person, I always want to recommend black queer people. Um, but that's one person who I would love to see on the show. And you know he a little intellectual and hella hella ratchet, and I and I know he's gonna be favorite. coming. <laughs> With his prosecco and his yes. little bit of Grand Marier. So when you, when you Woo, he a sweet one, I can tell. All right. <laughs> like, so so no. listen, I'm gonna put in the personal word, but that's somebody who I know. Thank like that would be the conversation of the year. Okay. The conversation <laughs> of the year, you say. Listen, well, besides this one. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> he was like qualifier. Um, no, thank you. I'm actually writing George down now. Um, I really uh, just let me thank somebody. Oh, I don't know if I can name names of people who just donated Good. something, but thank you so much, Ruben. I appreciate on, Ruben. you. Yes, Listen. Yes, 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 yes. Listen, I appreciate you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so what I was gonna say was I, I just thoroughly appreciated this conversation. I hope that at some point when I get past my nerves being bad, that I could reach out to you and just say, Hey boo, how you doing? Listen. Um, yeah. Because this has been a very wonderful conversation. I feel very much grounded. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I hope that you have an, an amazing evening. Um, I hope that you continued. If you're if you're bothered, we don't know about it. And so just continue <laughs> with that. But also give us a signal if we need to descend and like pop off people. on some of your haters. Like, I got you. I got you. Okay. This send the people. Yes. Listen, I got you. So I, I'll got send you. the people. Because they were like, listen. oh my God, Didi said we need to do this. Done for Didi. <laughs> You leave Preston alone. <laughs> I will remember that. I will. <laughs> I love you. I hope that you have a good you. night. And this Thank has been another you. amazing episode of The Full Set. Y'all have a yes. good night. Yes. All right. Good night. Peace.